Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker, musician, music journalist, and producer, welcoming you to the Michigan Music History Podcast, covering all the territories of the mitten. We cast from around the block of the brand new Michigan Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, in the heart of the Great Lakes Bay region. And I'm joined by Michigan Music Royalty, sitting to the left and right, Dr. J. Gary Johnson of the Michigan Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and MichiganRockAndRollLegends.com website, and Sir Fred Reif, Michigan music author, publisher, manager, and musician. Together they have taught, lectured, traveled, hosted, and have been quoted worldwide on all things Michigan music. Chances are you stood next to them at the record store or shoulder to shoulder at concerts over the years. They are the record crate diggers and the library micro fishermen that have dug around for the details, the credits, and the lineage that has been part of the backstory of Michigan music. So grab your favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us as we open up a can of earworms on Michigan's rich music history. Welcome to the Michigan Music History Podcast Show, channeling through all styles and eras of Michigan music from before you were born up through this very minute. And now, your host, Scott Baker. Hey, MMHP and the 989 listeners. We are giving you a little bit of a throwback episode today. This is actually our fifth recorded episode but it's coming out as our 10th episode due to uh, what we had to do to mix things up in our season here. All the way back to March. But uh, Dr. J is covering the Supremes, Barry Gordy, Stevie Wonder, all the way through Rare Earth, Madonna. Touches on Question Mark of the Mysterians, uh, Sun Records, Motown Records, School Kid Records, Sir Fred throws in there. Lots of good stuff. The small labels, the subsidiaries, what made Motown huge in Michigan. Uh, a little bit of a interesting side note here. Pretty Things, SF Sorrow, their first record, which was the first concept album, Beating the Who Out. And there's even a little uh, Easter egg, Dick Wagner bit at the end that we're looking for from our listeners, if anybody knows. So uh, jump back in with us here. Dig in. We're going to give you the reasons why Motown is Michigan wrapped in a bow. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to the Michigan Music History Podcast. I'm MHP in the 989 here. We are uh, in the midst of a March warming, windy trend outside and uh, enjoying the weather, actually. You don't have to be heated up today too much, so it's kind of nice outside. Oh, loving it, man. All the snow is gone. We got yeah. Dr. J and Sir Fred with smiles on their face. I think we're all a little bit uh, getting that sunshine happiness out. It's... It's a little early to call it a spring, but hey, we'll take it when we can get it here, and especially with uh, St. Patrick's Day coming up upon us here. How's everybody doing, Dr. J? Great, great. Sir Fred? Great. Good. So uh, since we last went on here, we uh, we talked Cooper, and we've talked a few other things on some shows, but uh, Cooper hit number one, and uh, Gary was trying to explain how about Billboard's number one because it's so not as number one as it used to be, like top 200, you said? Well, that was... I think that's be. the chart that used to be the standard, but uh, they've broken everything down into different genres and so on. And so I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, it seemed like Alice Cooper's new album was, uh, was it in the top rock chart or something like <laughs> mm -hmm. that? Uh, but, you know, number one, whatever, it's yeah. still great. And uh, it's nice to see a Michigan rock and roller topic a chart no matter which one it is absolutely i noticed last night too uh, i was looking at that because he was posting it on a few of his pages uh somebody did uh one of them live music magazines did a rundown of all his records and they put detroit at number five of his albums that's pretty good for a 72 year old rocker with some great albums under his belt already yeah i don't think i would rate it that high but uh <laughs> You know, it yeah. still was pretty entertaining. Though. Yeah, I was impressed. I'm like, there's a lot of good stuff going on with that right now. Yeah. You know, rock and roll kind of needs this old man to kick it in the butt. But yeah, so uh, tonight we are doing the Motown night. And uh, Dr. J's got some uh, envious Motown stuff that he gets to share with us. As, and uh, hopefully, you know, add some points about what's going on with his um, Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, too, because Motown is definitely going to be a big part of that. And we're also going to swing into a little bit of the Caribbean side, Michigan's Caribbean scene, which Sir Fred uh, has really 
known a lot about, when, especially when he lived down in Ann Arbor. There was a whole scene that he paid attention to, and he, he wanted to, to kind of blend that in. I think the Motown Caribbean thing, uh, two different kinds of styles, but that R&B is always underneath it all. And then uh, we're also going to hit two more records of the week for these cats. So uh, Motown, 191 number one singles coming out of Motown all these years. Wow. Wow. I did a little research, but... Uh, That's incredible. Yeah, I was floored by that. Then they said plus 10 cover versions of Motown songs that, that hit number one. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Welcome to Detroit. <laughs> yes, indeed. That was quite the record label. Well, they're uh, still... A, they're not... I was reading a little thing like, are they still a label or what? And my, my research took me to say, as of 2009, they are under the universal music label um umbrella because so almost many are most most are there's just big umbrellas that are covering all the labels all these years but motown is not usually used as a record label it's just filed under the motel or the universal umbrella uh, so at least for uh the last 12 years it's hasn't been really doing a whole lot matter of fact Last year, it came out Stevie Wonder, our Saginaw's own Stevie Wonder. He left Motown after nearly 60 years on Motown. October 15th, he announced his own imprint label, and he was leaving uh, Motown for the first time because he's doing his own thing, which I think everybody's doing their own thing under all these umbrellas now. Right. Plus right. the freedom. But uh, what kind of Motown drives you wild, Dr. J? Well, I like the early stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Motown when it was headquartered in Detroit. And uh, I thought that that was one of the worst things that happened to the city is when Motown left. I, I, it just, I don't know, it kind of took the heart out of Detroit, I thought. Uh, but, you know, that music that they produced at Hitsville, USA, you know, the famous studio on West Grand Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's pretty tough to top that, you know, and for really it from 1959 with that very first single, um, Come to Me by Marv Johnson, and right up until I think uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, What's Going On might have been one of the last things that was recorded at the original studio and from that point on pretty much everything was done out in california and what was the first song you said came out of there come to me by mark oh, johnson the, the most of that did too tremendous even though because well, i got yeah it was a top 40 top 40 okay. yeah the very first big hit that i have written in my notes mary wells my guy uh may 16th 1964 well, that was a number one. Okay, but that's they had they had a okay. number one before that. Um, Please, Mister Postman by the Marvelettes in 1961 was the first number one on the Billboard pop charts. But before that, uh, really the the record that really put Motown on the map, you know, as far as being able to distribute their own uh, releases and so on, was Shop Around by the Miracles. Oh, okay. Which was a big R and B hit. That was number one on the R and B charts for uh, I don't know eight to ten weeks or something like that. It got to number two on the pop charts, but uh, Smokey, you know, Smokey was yeah. the, the label's first big star. Right, right, okay. So I, I was doing some scrubbing, so I was doing quick notes yeah. on that, that. But it said the first hit, Mary Wells, my guy, and I'm like, okay. I was just doing, yeah. I was just trying to catalog the firsts and the big moments, you know. And somehow that was the feed. So I don't know how that worked out, but yeah, you know, well, that, that was a, that was a big hit. But they had plenty of uh, big hits before that. Um, but one of the interesting things about Motown was um, they made a deal right off the bat, Barry Gordy Jr. did, with um, American Record Pressing in Owasso. And so the very first singles ever pressed, um, this would have been on the Tamla label, which was the first label that uh, Motown um, issued records under. Um, they had it pressed at uh, American Record Pressing, a pressing plant in um, Owasso, Michigan, 
And I think it was in Smokey Robinson's book, he wrote that he and Barry Gordy drove from Detroit to Owasso in a snowstorm Brilliant. to pick up the first boxes of these 45s. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, and then it became like things could happen back in these days on radio. It first became a big hit in Detroit. And, um, you know, this is really a good song. I don't know if we could play a, a, a little segment of Come to Me by Marv Johnson. But um, Barry Gordy signed him because his vocals were kind of a cross between Jackie Wilson and Clyde McFadder. So he had a very, um, uh, I guess you would uh, call it a, uh, um, a commercial type vocal sound. And he had written this song. This was originally written by Marv Johnson. And then Barry Gordy, who of course got his start uh, by writing uh, Jackie Wilson's first five hit 45s. Um, he took the song, kind of sweetened it a little bit. And uh, like I said, it was, uh, it made the top 40. I think it reached number 30 on the pop charts and was a much bigger hit on the R&B charts. And uh, so it, it, uh, it started in Detroit, got a lot of radio play. And, you know, that's the way bigger companies sometimes would find records to release. Uh, you know, it would be a regional hit and then a United Artists. Uh, a bigger label yeah. got interested. They cut a deal. Uh, Marv Johnson had to sign to the Universe, uh, uh, United Artists label. Uh, and Barry Gordy cut a deal. Gordy was his manager. He produced his records in Detroit and then provided the masters to United <laughs> Artists. So that really started the business going. Gotcha. You know, and he had... Uh, of course, the famous story, he uh, he started this with uh, an $800 loan. Barry Gordy? Yeah, yeah, from his family. Okay. And probably because of the racial attitudes and the discrimination of the day, uh, Barry Gordy's father had started this. Uh, it was almost like a credit union for the family. And all the kids and himself contributed money into this thing and then if somebody wanted a loan uh they could go to the family have a meeting present their idea and if it was a unanimous vote of the family then the money would be given to whatever project and so this was barry gordy's you know he wanted to start his own label mm -hmm. and uh so uh now, was he a songwriter at that point, too? Because I was oh, reading yeah. about the songwriting, yeah. and, and it says he was the very first songwriter for Motown, and obviously he was the guy that ran Motown. Um, well, right. Yeah. yeah, well, like we had said, uh, he made his name in the music business writing Jackie Wilson's first big hits when Jackie Wilson went solo. Uh, he had Reed Petit. That was the first one. And then a ballad, uh, To Be Loved. Then the big one was Lonely Teardrops. Okay. Um, that's why, um, I'm trying to think, what was, do you remember the fifth one? There was another hit. Anyway. I know. Yeah. But the, the big deal was, and I think Fred touched on this when we were talking about Mac Rice mm -hmm. and the fact that the B-sides of a single made as much money Oh, yeah. the hit set. That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. when when Barry Gordy was writing these hits for Jackie Wilson, he had formed like a songwriting partnership with Billy uh, Davis, his good friend, and his sister, Gwen Gordy. And so when the hits made money, his share was oh, okay. divided yeah. between three Three people. ways. Okay. And of course... It'd be the situation. You write the hit, and you're making one-third as much money as yeah. a songwriter on the B-side. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a big meeting with Jackie Wilson's manager, um, and he wanted, you know, access to the B-sides. Right. You know, I, you know I'm only making, I need more money, and so I can provide the B-sides. And, of course, 
you know, there was all the kinds of shenanigans in the record <laughs> business where, you know, you would you could give the B-side to people you knew or, Pen. yeah, somebody, uh, you know, that, that was an investor into the label or whatever, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things under right. the table going on. And so uh, Jackie Wilson's manager was a, a guy by the name of uh, Nat Ternopel, um, an interesting guy in his own right from Detroit. Um, he turned him down, and that's when uh, Barry Gordy, you know, broke his association with Jackie Wilson and, uh, you know, went into business for himself, so to speak. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Fred, you uh, you got some memories with all that, too? I seen you wanted to pop in there a couple times. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, I like the, the early stuff as well. Um, I wanted to mention another B-side. Uh, Gerald Marks, who wrote the song All of Me, he had the B-side of Gene Autry's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Did he really? Oh, my so gosh. He must have made a lot of money off of that one. Uh, what, sure. what was the B-side? I can't remember, remember it right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. But anyways, I kind of want to give um, a Saginaw interpretation or how Saginaw had something to do with uh, the Motown. beginning of Motown. Yeah. <clears throat> And that's with uh, the orchestra leader, Choker Campbell, who was from Saginaw. Okay. And. You have this in your book, right? Right? Well, it'll be in the next one. The next one, okay. I remember you saying something about this. And I, I can't find anything about Choker Campbell in Saginaw. His wow. real name was Walter Campbell. Uh -huh. And I've researched and researched and. I guess I have to go to the library and look up um, some of the yearbooks. Hopefully, he'll be in there. Because he left Saginaw when he was um, 19 or something. So, he went to school here. Okay. Or there. Um, so, anyways, Choker Campbell was the orchestra leader for the Idlewild Review. On the other side of the state, Arthur Bragg's <clears throat> and his Idlewild Review. And this is other side of the state, like as in Grand Rapids? A little north of Grand Rapids. Okay. Almost to Traverse? Or is it south? Well, it was a resort area. Right. By Baldwin, Michigan. Yeah. Oh, near right. Baldwin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, Interesting. For black people. Right. Yeah. Okay. It was the biggest black resort for in America at one point. Oh, okay. But anyways... Choker Campbell was the orchestra leader for Arthur Braggs, who was also from Saginaw, and the promoter for um, the clubs up there. And I was telling a, a, a good friend of mine in Saginaw, who's a sax player, and his uncle was Sonny Stitt. <laughs> so he was telling me a story once when he was a kid. He went with Sonny to Flint to Choker was living there at the time, and Choker was telling him that, yeah, this guy in Detroit wants to start this record label. And it was Barry Gordy. <laughs> wow. So it had to be in 59, or because that's when he started it. Right. So it was either 58 or 59 when... When that word came out. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so anyways... Choker Cambo went down to Detroit mm -hmm. and ended up becoming the um, Motown Orchestra, you know, who toured with the acts, who was on, like, this album. And he was the orchestra leader for... Right. Uh, uh, okay. Just for the touring, not, you know, the Funk Brothers were... Okay. And none of the Funk Brothers, I don't think, was in the, the touring band. No, okay. I was going to ask you that, because that, that awesome movie that's all standing in the shadows of Motown, I have that on the DVD right. Blu-ray. I don't recall his name no. coming up in that. No, he was just for, you know, the touring. And that's what this is, uh, 1963. And he's, you know, he did it until, I think, when they moved to California. Hey, you can put that album to your on your right side, and you can show it right to that camera that's up on that book there. Oh, there you I go. Didn't know we were... Yeah, we're live. So move it over a little bit towards the microphone. There you go. That's what he's looking at. Live at the Apollo 
What's the name of that whole record? Because you, you just did the... Recorded live at the Apollo, this past, volume one, 1963. This was uh, Sir Fred's pick of the week last weekend. We were warming up for the Motown week here, and uh, we'll, he'll be talking about that album in depth here in a few a few podcasts. But uh, So Choker, how long did he last in the organization? Did you guys tell Well, me? I think up until they moved to uh, California. I'm not okay. totally sure. Interesting. Because he went off and did some other thing but he's a Saginaw guy right fantastic wow and another guy that was in the orchestra a Saginaw guy was uh Jerry Holmes also played the saxophone huh he Excellent. had a band, he had a jazz band in Saginaw later on called Silk but um okay you know I just wanted to talk about the Saginaw yeah the th the connection here the right the connection yeah sure yeah, no, and then Stevie Wonder, obviously, on the label from... Uh, well, you know, in my research, Stevie, his mother, moved to Detroit when he was six months old, as far as the research I got. And I've had people on Facebook say, I remember this blind guy at Saginaw High. And I'm going, I don't think that was Stevie. <laughs> You know, oh, really? and things like that. But as far as I know, his mother moved to Detroit when he was six months old. I don't know where the historical marker is at. But, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd have to. It seemed to me it was. I just it was a that. little later though, because didn't she? She moved in part so that he could go to the Michigan School for the Blind, right? I think that was. Well, part I of the think deal. she was getting away from a bit. her husband oh, okay or or something like, yeah stevie wonders yeah father I'm not sure about that but i'm not totally sure i'm you know it's, i had I a, stevie would just, possibly know just over the yeah <laughs> I, I i am unfam i don't really know my uh friend rick robinson or robinson he posted to me this week uh the <clears throat> historical marker in saginaw that's a little rock with thing on it and then that little Thing. Somebody just put it on Facebook. Yeah, it, today oh, it, or yesterday. I, or he something. just sent this to me a couple of days ago, and I'm like, oh, okay. And he says, isn't this sad? And I'm like, I'm like, well, that's cool. I think because I wish Madonna would have one like that in Bay City. But his well, I point guess it's was, in a parking lot now. Yeah, he says his thing was there's never enough of that around town promoting some of the great artists. Says, that's how our podcast kind of feels about a lot of Michigan artists and where they're at, and there's never going to be enough promo of who come from where whether it be question mark from Bay City Madonna from Bay City Stevie from Saginaw or your backstory to fill it in on how that came about which is fantastic I didn't know that uh, he might not have been born here <laughs> no he was born here but you know left at six months yeah oh that, that's what you're saying okay yeah I get it yeah. but I'm not totally sure on that okay but well. I, I, you know, again, you don't know how accurate uh, Wikipedia is. Right. But this says that uh, um, she she moved um, with her children to Detroit when Stevie Wonder was four. I heard that one, too. So. Yeah, so. Hmm. But he left Saginaw. Yes, we do know that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But at 12 years old, fingertips. Yeah. Pretty. Still one of my favorite songs. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, harmonica players tell me that, that that's a great harmonica song for somebody 12 years old, especially. Oh, I bet. Yeah. He was so talented. It's, he still is. Still is. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, we were talking about Frank Rodriguez, who just celebrated his 70th, 70th. birthday. Yes. Uh, that Frank uh, did a little nod to uh, Stevie Wonder in uh, Question Mark and the Mysterians' second charting record. I Need Somebody played that little bit of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh. Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah. Which, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Stevie did in Fingertips. Oh. Uh, little tip of the hat. Uh, well, Frankie had a birthday yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Happy birthday, Frank. A good guy. Uh, yeah. I love it. I, I remember my, one of the first times I we were when they did the big comeback shows in the late 90s when Chad Cunningham was uh, putting them on his label Bullfrog out there and they were touring New York and around again. 
that winter I was in Best Buy picking up some CDs and they just, just when they started carrying the Casio keyboards and all that, and I'm not paying attention. I'm just checking out the CDs and all of a sudden I hear, bah, 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 da, 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 da. and I'm like, what? I go around the corner. Here's Frankie laughing. He's, he's jamming on the uh, Casio. <laughs> it was too cool. Yeah. I'm like, ah, it's awesome, man. <laughs> we got the, we got the original cat right there. That, that line inspired so much music and so much music around the world but yeah there uh that's cool he ta he nodded to motown little stevie wonder Mot thing there and uh their second record have you guys yeah been well to the in fact that was the number one hit before my guy also <laughs> oh because yeah. that was 63 right yeah. when uh fingertips was number one yeah i think so yeah yeah oh, okay <laughs> awesome have you guys been to the motown museum me no Oh yes, yeah, I've been there several three times. times. Yeah, oh, I'll go great. again. Well, you know they're they're putting a tremendous amount of money into expanding that. Right, it's going to be a great. It sounds like a big building behind the original uh, location of uh, Hitsville, you, USA. You remember the uh, display of the Supremes dresses that they wore on the Ed Sullivan show? Yeah. Well, they believable. I mean, well, they they had a they had a bigger display at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. When they um, we happened to be there one time when the the Supremes were being highlighted, you know, upstairs where they, you know, a different artist, and uh, you know, they had quite a few gowns. Uh, yeah, it was great. Well, they were tiny. Those, yes, those dresses were. Mm. That's cool. I, I would. I've been waiting for the day to go down there. I have yet to oh, make a trip. Right. It's it's very much worth uh, going down. It's uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, and just to you know, just see in that studio. Yeah, out the small studio, and then upstairs where they they had the echo chamber where you could do the vocals. Uh, a little. <laughs> opening yeah, you can actually ceiling. go up to Barry Gordy's apartment up there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh wow! Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I'm, I know it's going to be on my list of, you know, my bucket list of things. I, I've hit the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland a few I times. I haven't done that yet. I've done that three or four times, but um, Motown, I don't know. I've never stopped there. I've well, we did a, uh, I ran a couple trips uh, through the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Saginaw Valley, where I've been doing the rock and roll classes for the last uh, uh, 17 years or so, and uh so we did uh, we did a bus trip where we drove down to Cleveland, uh, went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, spent the day there, stayed overnight, and then did a tour of Cleveland, and which was kind of interesting. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the movie uh, Christmas Story, yeah. which was shot in downtown Cleveland, a lot of the scenes there. Um, and then on the way back, we would stop at the Motown Museum and take the tour there. Wow! So I did that a couple times. That was a lot of fun. That one particular trip was out the was out the um the Supremes trip you were talking about, or just uh, no? That wasn't the one where the Supremes were. They had uh, they had a big thing on Johnny Cash. They had his tour bus there, mm. and uh, you know I think there was a big uh, Johnny uh, Johnny Cash display. You know, they just switch it around various times, uh, highlighting different artists. It's always mm -hmm. fun to go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, you know, there's places where you can stay, you know, because it's it's pretty difficult to go down there. You know, if you're driving from the Bay City area, you know, it's probably about four, four and a half hour drive yeah. to get there. And, you know, you want to be able to spend the day in the Hall of Fame really... Uh, you know, Take to it all see in. everything. Yeah, there's so many videos and different things and all kinds of interesting stuff to look at. So you want to, you know, give yourself somewhere, you know, at least six hours, I would think, mm -hmm. to be able to ad uh, adequately uh, go through the hall and see everything you want to see. And then, you know, Cleveland's a pretty good town. They've got music there and, uh, you know, good restaurants and so on. So you can usually stay in a place that's not too far from the hall. Uh, you know, we've stayed there when, when Lynn and I have went there. Most of the times, I think every time we've been able to walk to the hall. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
last time we were there was the big induction uh, a couple years ago with Stevie Nicks and uh, Roxy Music and The Cure and uh, right. you know and it, it was all on closed circuit. Okay. But uh, yeah, it was pretty rowdy in there. You know, it used to be when we went down. Like for example, the first time we went to see a um, an induction ceremony was when Madonna was inducted and you know i'd done a lot of research on madonna and bay city and so on and you know i was very interested in in going down there and you know they had uh you know when uh when madonna was inducted uh, you know they had bay city michigan yeah. flashed on the screen which was pretty darn cool i, I will see. never forget that when i yeah, saw that pop was, on tv it was really yeah. neat. and uh then of course uh she made what i thought was the greatest rock and roll move you know if anybody uh, doesn't think Madonna belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I want to tell you, you know, when um, when it came time for the performances, she brought out Iggy and the Stooges, yeah. who did two punky Detroit rock and roll versions <laughs> of Madonna's song, mm. and she was right in the front row, and you know she. You know, was from Detroit. She knew all about the Stooges, and yep. you know, actually, Madonna was in a punk rock band. Yeah, in, in New York uh, before she got into the dance rock scene, and uh, you know, the music they made her famous. So, uh, that's so yeah, cool. That was, that I forgot really about that, but yeah. that was a totally cool move on her part yeah, to do and, it. And you know, the idea was the Stooges were not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, you know, she gave them a chance to shine and, you know, in front of uh, the voters, yeah. uh, you know, basically, <laughs> right. as well as a, a national audience. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, I think, uh, the year or the year after or maybe two years after the Stooges finally were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. Now, where is the MC5? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Where's Grand Funk Railroad? Uh, oh, yeah. Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. Mitch yes. is not in it. No. Mm -mm. And, and, you know, another, you know, this is when I knew uh, um, the uh, CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who I had met there. You know, I wrote him a couple times about, you know, Mary Wells is not in. You know, the mm -hmm. first lady of Motown had, you know, really helped put Motown on the map and, uh, you know, the Marvelettes aren't in there. Is Jack Scott in it? Jack Scott is not in there. He's in yours. I, I well, just yes. read that today. Yeah. <laughs> you know, gosh, and, uh, you know, Jack Scott, for a four-year period, he had many as many songs on the on the charts as anybody did. You know, plus having two-sided records. Right. You know. No, what label sides? was Jack Scott on? Well, he started True. out on, yeah, he started out on Carlton. Okay. And then his last hits were on uh, a label called Top Rank. Okay. But he was a chart busting. Oh, he was. I think he had more hits than a lot of Motown artists, didn't he? Or well, for. Something I read. You he, know, for a four year period, you know, to have. I don't, I'm trying to think of it. I think it was like 17 charting hits in a four year period. Uh, a lot of these were two-sided, and that's an era, you know, where it's difficult to get both sides of a record played yeah. enough to chart. Uh, you know, that's territory. That's Ricky Nelson or Elvis. Yeah. You know, that, and he uh, wrote them, I think, didn't he? Yes, a lot of the stuff he wrote. Okay. Almost, almost all of his hits. Hmm. Huh. So he was competing against our Motown night tonight. That well, we actually, he was a little before Motown. Right. Motown okay. was just starting, you know, with uh, Marv Johnson, uh, uh, you know, 59, uh, the uh, shop around late 1960 into 1961, the uh, Marvelettes, please, Mr. Postman, 1961. Uh, that's when things were just starting to take off. Mary Wells, I think in 61, had her first charting hits. I don't know, The Contours, Do You Love Me? That was probably 62, you think? Uh, somewhere in there. Yeah. You know, that was, you know, Motown was just really starting to take off. And then, you know, where Motown really, really hit big starting in 64, you know, with the Supremes and the Temptations and the Four Tops, plus everybody else, you know, that had already been. And that part yeah. of the label. 
And yeah, which is like when all these other R and B artists were kind of getting bumped off the charts by the British invasion, the Beatles, you know, Motown was right there, you know, and probably helped because the Beatles were big fans of Motown. Right. Yeah, great timing on that, all yeah. that rock and roll all at one time. Right. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and having the um the band they had, uh, um, like standing in the shadows, guys. You know all those members and the the, the guys that would play behind all those songs. It was uh, bringing the R and B rock, n the northern version of it. You know, which you know down south you had the Muscle Shoals guys and all that. But these uh, were all jazz guys too, and they're all in this book. Yeah, you know <laughs> that before Motown, history of De of jazz in Detroit. Basically, but uh, most of all the um, perfect of the Funk Brothers are in this book as jazz musicians. Uh, they all had their chops before right. they, they rocked out <laughs> or R and B grooved it. That's a heck of a book. What, 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 tell us a little bit about that book, there, Fred. Well, it's written by Lars Born and Jim Gallard. Uh, Lars is out of Ann Arbor and Jim in Detroit, and. Uh, they just wrote a book just to let people know there was music in Detroit before Motown. Right. I mean, same as the blues and yeah. R&B, but, yeah. and this is really detailed. Speaking of jazz and blues, were there jazz and blues artists signed to Motown at any point? I, I, it seems to me that I, I remember someone saying, I mean, it could have been later in the 70s or something, but. Did, did any of that sure. genre touch the Motown label? Well, you know, Barry, Gordy, Barry Gordy Jr. signed a lot of different artists. I know he signed Billy Eckstein, who right. was, you know, somebody he really admired uh, as, I guess, he would be considered a jazz vocalist. Wouldn't yeah, he? I guess so. Yeah. He also hired uh, uh, Johnny Powers. Oh, yeah, rockabilly guy. You know it. Who, uh -huh. And Johnny was on our label, School Kids label. But so I got to know him pretty well, and he was promoting basically as the only guy who's been on Sun and Motown. Oh, really? Yeah. In fact, Johnny Powers uh, might have recorded the last single uh, that was done at the original. Oh. Sun Studio okay. right. um, in Memphis. Uh, uh, Sam Phillips had developed this very sophisticated new studio. Um, I think it was probably outside of town. Um, but it didn't have the same feel, really, as that great studio there on Union Street. It was mm -hmm. at 706 Union Street in, in Memphis uh, where he'd record all those great Singles by Elvis and Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, yeah, you know, and many, many others. Boy, that's Dr. Uh, Ross, Dr. Ross, <laughs> the yes, indeed. Ike Turner, you know, oh, Rocket well. 88, you know. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, right on. I, I was just curious of, of uh, other genres touching that soul and RB, that Motown Detroit groove, because you guys would know more than I would about. Well, that. there was Fortune Records, which. That new book is out. Right, Mind and Over Matter. JVB, Joe Von Battle, he recorded a lot of the R&B people. Okay. Wow. As well as a lot of gospel, C.L. Franklin, Rita's father. Okay. That was on Motown? No, this okay. was on JVB. JVB, okay, I didn't, I didn't know, okay. Right. Yeah, a lot of those smaller labels kind of seemed to you know, go out of business when Motown got really big. And, of course, Barry Gordy was buying up a lot of these right. smaller labels. Um, what are so, some of them smaller labels that, that he um, bought up back then that, that did something? Tri-Fi? Yeah, Tri-Fi and Harvey. Those were... Anna. Uh, well, that was his sisters. Yeah. Um, well, Tri-Fi and Harvey were... Uh, Harvey those Fuqua. Label, yeah, Harvey, Harvey Fuqua. Fuqua. Of, Form those labels, and uh, that's where Junior Walker and the All Stars came from. The Spinners, also. Okay. Um, trying to think who else was was on those labels. Well, then he bought. Um, uh, was it the? Um, he bought the Golden World. 
yeah okay label and that's where he got the second studio in detroit the golden world studio which was probably better equipped than actually hitsville was um is that where he got edwin Starr? i think so from there um yeah it wasn't golden world what was the other label there that edwin Starr recorded at? Uh, I can't yeah. think, you know, he had... Uh, I saw Edwin Starr. At Agent the Double O Soul uh, was a big hit. Uh, and then, of course, when he went to Motown, he had some really big songs there, War. And so he got to step off a Motown subsidiary and go directly to Motown. Well, it, it wasn't a, a subsidiary. It was, a, it was a, a label owned by a guy by the name of Ed Wingate. Oh, yeah. And he, he sold his studio and his labels to Barry Gordy for a reported $1 million. <laughs> now, is that a Mich was that a Michigan label? Yeah, Detroit. Oh, he, yeah. Oh, oh, it was Detroit. So he's buying up local. Yeah. Oh, okay. in, in fact, Terry Knight and the pack recorded their very first single on one of Ed Wingate's label. He named it after himself, the Wingate oh. label. And it was... Uh, it was issued as just the pack, not Terry Knight in the pack. Oh. So yeah, there's just all kinds of connections out there. Was it Rare Earth? Stuff. Uh, were they on a Motown? Yeah. Well, they were. Um, they were on another label. Yeah, I, I know that. I can't um, think of yeah, uh, th but they were called the Sunliners at that point. Oh. They were, you know, like apparently one of the top bands in Detroit. You know, playing clubs and so on. And, Oh, I just thought that was cool. That was like one of the more rockingest rocking bands that were the long version of yeah. <laughs> Get Ready. Get Ready. Oh, it's yeah. always good. <laughs> it's Twenty-two classic. minutes long or something. Yeah. Like I that. remember when they came to Bay City. That one you're playing the pig gig. Right. That was worth just watching that alone. They, they were tearing it up. There was a lot of energy in their music, and you know that, that's that's some cool stuff there to tie into Motown, which you don't think, you know, Motown, you think Supremes or, you know, something Well, like Motown, that. that Rare Earth label uh, was their attempt to kind of plug into um, the uh, album rock uh, stuff that was kind of became a real big deal. FM? Well, you know, I think sort of like the Woodstock generation. Okay where albums really started to be, mm. uh, you know, the uh, means of recording, you know, and singles were starting to dwindle a little bit. But that uh, that Rare Earth um, label, they signed the Pretty Things. Oh, really? From England. You I know, didn't know Which that. were kind of like, um, I don't know, the, the shaggier version of the Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they had... Uh, and they were pretty big in England. They somehow they never really caught on in the uh, the U.S. But they had uh, they did a couple of uh, real interesting albums on um, on the Rare Earth label. Um, P.F. Sorrow was um, most people credited it with being the first rock opera. It came out before Tommy. Really. And it, you know, that's uh, that's on a lot of lists. You know, people list the you know mm -hmm. greatest albums of all time. You might find that one there. And actually, I like their second album a little bit better. It was called Parachute. It wasn't so much of a concept album, but uh, it was pretty good. But you know, neither one of those did anything. How did you, when when you were younger, how did you find out about that? Well, I didn't even realize. I guess you know, it just. Um, I bought the Parachute album in a discount bin. Okay, cutout. Yeah, it was a cutout, and uh, it was really a good album. And that through that, uh, I think I'd read a review of P.F. Sorrow in uh, Rolling Stone magazine. That's so cool. And, uh, you know, that's been, Rolling Stone was really a music magazine. You know, they had a lot of reviews. Yeah, and, back You know, it's day, not the way yeah. it is today, you know, which is a little yeah. bit of everything. And, you know, they've changed with the times, but... Um, cutout bins. I yeah, love, cut, yeah, love they did cutout some, bins. Yeah, they did Cheap some, bins. some interesting <laughs> albums. I had, I bought an album called Toe Fat. I'm not sure where those guys are from, but that was on the Rare Earth label. 
Did you ever hear of them, Fred? Did you ever the run into that? The name sounds familiar. Yeah, I've heard of Tofet. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, were they I mean, around the Woodstock era? Well, it was it was probably around 1970 or 71. Okay, and it was one of those albums that I bought because I liked the cover. <laughs> nice. You know, I was thinking, geez, I'm going to take a chance on this because it was all these people. You know, they had uh, the whole cover was uh, like a bunch of shirtless guys that didn't have heads. They had toe. Uh, they had toes. <laughs> <laughs> on their shoulders. We're, yeah. we're going to have to I get wish, that. Yeah, I yeah. wish I would have had the album here yeah. to show you. I yeah, that is so cool. think of that. I still have that album. Toe right fat. Right. Toe fat. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, but the Meatloaf recorded uh, for him uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Stoney, Stoney and Meatloaf. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was after uh, the Popcorn Blizzard, or I think we talked about this right. in one of our former mm. episodes there, but um, Meatloaf recording at Art Shield Studio in Bay City. Yeah. So, I hmm. finally I went by there today. I found that house. Ah. On Raymond? Yes indeed. I don't know what took me so long. So I just I said today I'm gonna go all the way down Raymond till I find it. <laughs> and it was the last block, I think. Yeah, it's right it's right in between the two one ways. Right. Jenny and Town. Well I thought it was closer to Midland Street for oh, some yeah. reason. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. That's a ways away. Um did they have a for sale sign in the yard? I was only looking for that okay. 96 series. Because I drove by it coming into town. Uh, my wife got her second vaccination in uh, Midland, and I was driving back into town, and I looked down Raymond, and it looked like there was a, a maybe a for sale sign in the yard. I hope not. But they changed. Um, uh, Ed and Charlene Cotto are the couple that own the house now. And boy, they did a lot of... Uh, I work on it. In fact, you know, before we had put the sign up in the yard, I was taking this uh, this guy that's doing a film on Madonna in Bay City. Uh, I was kind of taking him around and showing him a few things. And I hadn't been by the, the house at 405 Raymond in a couple of years. And I didn't even recognize it. I thought it was on the wrong block the, because they had changed it so much. They put this big garage on the side and stone facing on the house huh. because the house itself had not looked different at all from probably the 1950s uh, you know for over 60 some years hmm. and then the Cottos really uh, did a lot of work on it it's a beautiful place now and uh, but the room in the back is still there was it oh. yeah and you know they're big fans of the Mysterians and, you know, they were really excited about having the sign in their yard. And, uh, uh, you know, the only hurdle was making sure I could get Bay City, you know, city government to agree to it, you know, without, you know, going through a mile of red tape. But, you know, thankfully it went pretty easily. And, uh, you know, Scott, in fact, uh, uh, Scott Cosley helped me put it in. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. What, what year did you put that in there? Uh, let me see, uh, 2000, I don't know, 2000, was it 2019? I think it was 2019. Okay. Yeah. In the summer. Yep. I remember the story on it. Well, that yeah. was, you know, when I came back and, uh, you know, I wanted to get that done before I went over to the Bay City Motor Company to remove all the stuff that was in there because uh, they said they were closing. They didn't tell me they were in legal hot water. <laughs> right. <laughs> so much <laughs> yeah we dove into that in a former podcast yes, that you yeah, can listen to all right. that about that's a that's a trip within itself actually it was the the two podcasts the number two the one where gary discussed all the rock and roll legends hall of fame but uh going back to motown uh anybody got any final thoughts on motown that we're uh, gonna toss out today we had a pretty good chat going in a lot of directions on that i i thought that yeah. was cool well, I mean, there's that's such a story. I mean, you know, of all the Michigan labels, <laughs> I mean, that there's nothing that even comes close to Motown as far as you know success. It, it was just phenomenal. No, I remember you guys mentioning reviews and shows like that back then, like the IMA and all that. Was there a Motown review that we got? Because if, if I recall. Isn't that one a record yeah. thing there? Yeah. Okay. That's what. Okay. Fred's I wonder about that. Motor when City, they're calling it. Okay. That the vinyl that Fred will uh, discuss in deep detail coming up here in a few 
podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fred's got some cool old vinyl, though. <laughs> Except I want to hear about, more about toe fat, too. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, there is a, uh, there's a great video, and I wish uh, somebody at Motown would take this, and it needs to, you know, it, they need work on the sound. Uh, you can hear the singers real well, but you can't hear the band, which I'm pretty sure was probably Joker Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, this was recorded at the Apollo. It might be that show, but yeah. it, it, it was... There's video then. Oh, it, it's okay. phenomenal. Um, but all you can see is is basically one song from every artist. But this was... This was before The Temptations had a hit. So they were on the show, but they were on it only as Mary Wells backing singers. Oh, wow. <laughs> so before Mary Wells came out, they did this little number, you know, all about Mary because she was, yeah. you know, the big female star on Motown. And then uh, Mary came on and uh, she did her first hit song, Bye Bye Baby, and... I'm trying to think. Of, um, the other one was maybe uh, You Beat Me to the Punch, or was it Two Lovers? Do they have her on there, Fred? She sings on here, Two Lovers and Bye Bye Baby. There it is. <laughs> so that's the show. Okay. Uh, and okay. so there is a video oh, of this, and it's just great. Wow. The contours are just doing somersaults. Really? They're just like unbelievable yeah they opened the show uh, we'd love to get good footage of that and oh, you'll be able to play, play and, that you know at the smoky and hall of uh, fame they had uh oh gosh you're martha and the vandellas uh, did doing, you see this on youtube or how did you come across this i bought the video uh there was a um i can't think of the company but this was back when we were uh when Chris Bilski and I were doing the, the rock and roll trivia shows, and we were always looking around for video because we had mm -hmm. all these TVs hooked up, you know, to play video as part of the trivia um, show. And, uh, yeah, so I saw this from this company. I said, you know, i got to have this, you know, being mm -hmm. a, a fan of early Motown. And it is really good. Is it VHS? But, um this is i've got it on uh dvd oh it's dvd okay yeah. but it's just mixed horribly or some yeah you like know that. it was it was a recording made probably from the television show and so the band that sound needs to be brought up i wonder if they can take the record bit. put the video together well, yeah, yeah. It should be able oh my to. gosh it, uh, you know it, it, in fact i know they've done it because um i bought a a dvd of um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, which is just a collection of performances. And one of them is from the um, show at the Apollo, and the sound is great, oh, okay. of the band. So they obviously took that performance and, you know, uh, did a little magic uh, and to bring out the sound of the band. Uh, so if they did that, it... It's, uh, this is volume really one, good. so there might be... There's probably a couple different yeah. nights taped well, out yeah, there. I mean, yeah. you know, you got an album there that's probably, what, maybe 38 minutes, 40 right. minutes long, like, right, something right. like that. That's about as much as you can get on a vinyl album. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the show probably lasted, you figure, an hour and a half to two hours or something like that with all the Motown acts coming on. Incredible. I want to... I definitely would like to see something like that come out. That's that's history that needs to. Oh yes, I mean that that's just Motown. Get polished right at the point where it was about to blast off because the Supremes performed and it was you know they had this was would have been uh, before uh, where did our love go or even before let me go the right way. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't even have uh, when the love light. Um, shine. I'm trying to think what the long title is. When all the light starts shining in his eyes, that was their first top forty hit. So yeah, that had to be early. Well, 63. this is sixty three. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, because I think later sixty three is when they had their first hit. You think they would have sang that for sure? You know, if that was uh, if that had been out yet. Before we sign off on Motown talk, I wanted to throw out their uh, Don Richard, who was our He's the webmaster and the guru behind a lot of Dick Wagner stuff when we were working in Saginaw. 
Don says the holy grail of Dick Wagner recordings is Dick played guitar on a track for Motown for somebody. He couldn't remember who. Yeah, I remember you writing me about that. I, think I had never heard of that. Yeah, and he says oh. if and if anybody knows what track that was and the 45 that's out there did i write what kind of what 45 i don't think the name of it was out there no it was just it's he but well, dick I, had I, mentioned the people he played on a motown track that was his oh. first professional recording really yeah yeah and, if uh, uh yeah if anybody has the title of the song you can track that down because there's all kinds of yeah we didn't have the title sites, obviously yeah, then where yeah. you could find out um you know who did it and that's like considered the gold standard of trying to find his stuff because nobody knows what it is or where it's at or what it, he I, he told a lot of people about it apparently so i have him on a reggae album he plays a guitar solo oh really it's on atlantic really i forget the name of the reggae band when we do our reggae thing next week or our next podcast coming uh -huh. down the road Bring that in. That's I a will. nice little history touch that I would think people would enjoy. It's a enjoy. great solo. I mean, it's kind of a little out of place in this reggae right. thing, but it's a... It's know, like a I'm rock sure and roller that, in, right. in reggae there. No, it makes sense. No, though, I want to throw that out there to our listeners. If, if, you, if you can... Uh, if anybody knows that, or any Motown connections that remember Wagner's... I guess it's in a, there was a ledger of players back in the day and all that. Hmm. Don went into some detail with me about it, but uh, I'm sure it's written somewhere or, you know, before everything got. Yeah, well, that was a problem at Motown is uh, the players were never listed. That was a big problem. In fact, the first yeah. record that they were listed was Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Oh, you know, really? That's really? 19, well, it was, it, it's going to have its 50th anniversary in wow. May. And that was your album of the week last weekend? Yeah. We'll be talking about that one coming up here, too. Yeah. The Caribbean portion and record of the week speak that we mentioned in the podcast will come out down the line in another future episode. We have a lot of album of the weeks that we have been posting, but um, we, uh, due to time constraints on our show, to trying to get you 45 minutes to an hour, we have been uh, putting aside, so that will come out in a later date. In the meantime, we hope you enjoyed the wrap of our Motown Michigan show. And we will see you again next week for the next episode of Michigan Music History Podcast, the MMHP and the 989. Thank you for tuning in. Additionally, Dr. J can be reached at michiganrockandrolllegends.com. Sir Fred can be hit up at fredrife.com. And Scott through scottbakermusic.com. You can also search Michigan Music History Podcast on Facebook and YouTube. You've been listening to the MMHP in the 989. From all of us.